Hello. Nice to see so many familiar faces. Um, and please feel free to move up. Don't be shy in the back. Um, I'd like to ask for our guest, um, how many of you here are students? So about half. Okay. And alumni and recent alumni. Okay. So welcome. Um, this summer, I was in Stabo Care um, in the Negev Desert in Israel moderating a panel on U.S.-Israel relations, and there was one outstanding speaker on that panel, and it was our guest today, Jonathan Reinold. I've actually had his paper from that conference, um, Israel in Post-Cold War U.S. Strategy, Asset, Liability, or Client, on my desk since th this summer. Um, so when I saw that Dr. Reinold had a book coming out, I was very excited. Um, pleased to, that he honored uh, our invitation to come here. Um, he's the director of the Argov Center for the Study of Israel and the Jewish People in the Political Studies Department at bar -Alan University, where he also serves as deputy head of the department and as a senior researcher at the Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies. Um, Dr. Reinold's research focuses on Israeli and U.S. approaches toward the Middle East peace process. Um, in this vein, he's authored many academic articles on, for example, the rise and fall of the Oslo process, the security barrier, and the Gaza disengagement. Um, I've seen him quoted recently um, in the news, and um, I'm sure we're going to have a lot of timely discussion tonight. But we have an extra treat because um, we have someone here who um, – is a very popular professor in the School of International Service here. In fact, when I was putting up signs for the event tonight, people were stopping and saying, oh, Professor Ziv's doing something tonight. So um, his work is in a very similar vein. In fact, we just had an event two weeks ago for Dr. Ziv's new book, which is displayed in the back. And um, if you could ask us, we can provide some information on how you might purchase that. Um, professor Ziv is an assistant professor in the School of International Services U.S. Foreign Policy Program. He teaches a class on U.S.-Israel relations, which um, is always capacity class with a waiting list. Um, and his op-eds as well have appeared on things like the recent Netanyahu visit. So we're um, very fortunate to have both of these guests here today, and I'm sure they'll talk about things like how strong a bond do Americans feel with Israel? Are there differences between liberals and conservatives? What about growing segments of Asians and Hispanics? How do they feel about Israel? And what's the future of U.S.-Israel relations? So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you very much for hosting me here at the American University. If anyone has any difficulty understanding my Israeli accent, just let me know. <laughs> OK. Uh, so let me start my watch. Um, what's, what's this book all about? Well, the book starts from my experience as an Israeli academic dealing with the academic boycott of Israelis in London and looking at what happened to the left in Britain, which was once upon a time very sympathetic to Israel and which has become very hostile. And I asked myself the question, could it happen in the United States? a country which is just a little bit more important than Britain in international politics, right? And that was the genesis of this, uh, of this book. So what you see in this picture is the qualitative difference between the relations between the US and Israel and Israel's relations with every other country in the world because Americans identify with Israel. And I think when you see the flags next to each other and looking up at the Capitol building, you get a sense of what I'm talking about. Is this going to work? Hang on a minute. Yeah. So Americans identify with Israel on the one hand, and sympathy for Israel is widespread, and it's actually surged to new heights in the new millennium, in the 21st century. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, however, Americans are increasingly divided about the Arab-Israeli conflict, not about Israel, about the Arab-Israeli conflict, and this division increasingly aligns with the major political, ideological, and religious divides in America. What is more, these divisions are mutually reinforcing part of a wider process of polarization in America. 
So on the one hand, it is the best of times. Never has Israel had more sympathy and more support in the American public than it does now. Never. Okay? But Americans are more divided about how one should relate to the polic American policy, Israeli policy, to the Arab-Israeli conflict than ever before. And what I do in the book is I look at why Americans identify with Israel, and then I look at the main divisions, party and ideology, Protestants, evangelicals and mainline Christians. Why Protestants? It's the largest religious group, and it's not just any religious group. It's the religious group that defined America, that set up America, and which has more influence over American identity than any other uh, group. In many ways, even Catholics in America are culturally Protestant, as we'll see. Then I looked at Jews. Jews may not be, of course, a very large group, but they are, of course, the most invested in Israel. Now, in this short talk, I'm going to focus on uh, party and ideology. But if you want in the questions to talk about some of the other things, I'm very happy to do too, and I will refer briefly to the other things as well. If we just look here at um, American sympathies in the Middle East, this is Gallup, okay? But we could equally take Pew. Those are the two most reliable, best polling agencies in the United States. What we see is Americans are always two to three times more sympathetic to Israel than they are to the Palestinians, always. That's consistent. But what's happened, if you look since 9-11, is that gap has grown. Okay? For Pew, most of the time, with the, with the exception briefly of the Gulf War in 1991, but generally speaking, a majority of Americans support Israel, but not an absolute majority, not over 50%. Since 9-11... Yeah, it's gone up to 60, 63, 64, 61, 62 pro-Israel. That is higher than it's ever been before. Okay? And if we compare that with attitudes in Europe, yeah, whether it's favorable opinion towards Israel or sympathy, we can see that the, it's grown, and, and in Europe it's a completely different case. Right? So when I talk about the margin of sympathy, I'm talking about the gap between those who sympathize more with Israel and those who sympathize with the Palestinians. Uh, what's the gap? The larger the gap, the larger the margin. Okay? Americans have become more and more sympathetic to Israel. Europeans are not sympathetic to Israel on balance. Okay? They don't have a favorable opinion of Israel. Okay? So America starts at a higher point, and that's grown. Europeans are lower and they remain lower, okay? Helping to protect Israel is among the top five answers um, of, of what goals should be for American policy in the Middle East. 75% thought it was an important goal. If we ask Americans who are uh, our most important allies, they say Britain, Australia, Canada, and then Israel. In other words, English-speaking countries, then Israel. That wasn't the case before 9-11. Israel was below Japan, and it was below Germany, and it was below several other countries. It has become more important to Americans. Why do Americans sympathize with Israel? They sympathize with Israel because they identify with Israel. Um, America was set up by Puritans and Protest Puritan Protestants for whom reading the Bible was critically important. Hebrew was compulsory at Harvard and Yale. Latin and Greek were compulsory at Oxford and Cambridge. Okay? Americans, even a third of American Catholics, believe that because it says in the Bible that God gave the land of Israel to the Jews, that impacts how one should look at Israel today. Israel has a right, Jews have a right to self-determination in the historic land of Israel. The Pope does not believe this. The Pope doesn't says the Bible theologically doesn't count for the Catholics, but it does for Protestants. And as far as culture goes and Israel goes, a third of American Catholics are Protestants, right? So America, America is the most religious society in the West. It's a predominantly Protestant form of religion. Protestants are sympathetic to Israel and to Zionism. That's one side of the identification. The other is the American creed, America as a democracy. Other countries have democratic systems. For Americans, being a democracy is part of your identity. It's the Constitution is what Americans would answer if they ask, what makes you American? In Britain, it would be football, cricket, or the Queen, right? It's different. 
People would say Britain is a democracy, but it's not what makes Britain Britain. Whereas for America, being a democracy is what makes America America. And if one looks at the all the countries that received independence in the world after 1945, only two have been democratic all the way through, Israel and India, and India was neutral in the Cold War. That leaves Israel. So that whole side of Israel as a democracy is very important. Now, that doesn't mean that people think that everything Israel does is okay. They may be very critical of Israeli policies if they think that they're not acting in a sufficiently democratic manner. But that's qualitatively different from Europeans who identify with the Palestinians because they're weak. Americans will say, we identify with Israel because it's a democracy, but we don't like this and that policy. Europeans will say, we identify with the Palestinians because they're weak. We identified with Israel and the Jews when they were weak. Now we identify with the Palestinians. That's different. It's qualitatively different. Okay. Another reason that Americans identify with Israel so much is because they don't identify very much with those countries or organizations that are opposed to Israel. Right? Look at Iran and the Palestinian Authority. They are among the most least most popular uh, countries in the United States. And there's a feeling, okay, this feeling has only intensified since 9-11. In other words, since 9-11, there's been a surge in support for Israel, which is related to the fact that Americans increasingly see Israel as having common enemies, terrorism, Islamist extremism, okay? So the surge in support for Israel is to do with Israel's enemies, the identification with Israel, the initial sympathy, the reason there's a gap with Europeans is to do with American identity and the identification with Israel, okay? So that's the first part of the paradox. Why are Americans so supportive of Israel? Why has that support gone up? What about the second part? Well, here's the evidence. Okay, if we look at sympathy for Israel over the Palestinians, we see that Republicans, the gap between the percentage of Republicans who sympathize with Israel and the percentage who sympathize with the Palestinians has grown hugely, right? Hugely. Okay, now Democrats, it's also grown a little bit. Right? Democrats are sympathetic to Israel. Put the Democrats in ever, any other country in the world and they'll be the most sympathetic to Israel. It's only compared to Republicans that they're less. But that gap has grown si over the last 20 years, yeah? since the beginning of the peace process. And if it was just a case of, well, Republicans love Israel and Democrats love Israel as well, just a little bit less, we could shrug our shoulders and say, so what? But when we get to policy questions, then we see a divide. So Republicans are equivocal about a Palestinian state. In 2002, a small majority thought it was a good idea. In 2009, a small majority thought it was a bad idea. They're really divided about it. Democrats are increasingly firm that they support the creation of a Palestinian state. Jerusalem in a two-state solution. Republicans think it should be united under Israel. Democrats think it should be divided between two states. Who's serious about peace? Who's to blame? So both sides think that Israel is serious about peace. But the gap yeah, about how serious has grown. Republicans are more convinced that Israel's serious, and Democrats are not always so convinced, but still a majority think that, that we are. The real difference is on the Palestinians, because there's a divide of 62 percentage points. And a slim majority of Democrats think that the Palestinian Authority is serious about peace, whereas a huge majority of, de of Republicans think they're not. <coughs> the use of force. Democrats were equivocal in 2006 and 2009 about Israel. Some, on some questions, they thought Israel was justified. Some questions, they thought Israel wasn't justified. Um, Republicans are stridently think Israel was justified on this issue. And this is from 2014, in the, the most recent conflict. And here you see Republicans clearly think Israel was justified. And Democrats, though they're more divided, and that's characteristic of Democrats, they tend to be more divided, a majority think Israel was unjustified. And that's a war that in Israeli terms was, had, had blanket support, yeah, across the board support. Should the US get tough with Israel over settlement? Democrats say yes. Republicans say no. Should the U.S. side with Israel? Republicans increasingly say yes. Democrats prefer 
the American have a, America has a balanced policy. A significant minority of Democrats think you should side with Israel, yeah? But still, it's a difference, okay? And if we, if we look at the elite discourse, in other words, not just public opinion, we go to look at the magazines like The New Republic, The Atlantic, The American Conservative, um, The National Review, exactly. And we look at, okay, over 20 years, how do they talk about the Arab-Israeli conflict? What we see is that Republicans in the 90s were divided about whether the peace process was a good idea. Since 2000, they've been a lot clearer. And the conservative discourse basically says, Israel and the United States share common enemies, radical Islam and terrorism. Israel's the frontline ally. We need to support Israel. We share common values. We share common enemies. We need to have an assertive foreign policy Use of force is important. We need to get out there and interventionist. The Palestinians are mainly to blame for the peace process. Okay? They're divided about the disengagement. Some were very much in favor. Some weren't. Okay? But they're clear about Israel as a strategic asset. Right? Liberals are very clear that they support the peace process. They're very clear that they support two-state solution. They're very clear that they oppose settlements. They were divided about who's to blame for the, peace, the collapse of the peace process in 2001. Some said Israel, some said both, some said the Palestinians. They were divided about disengagement. Was it a good idea? Was it advancing the peace process? Was it not advancing the peace process? They are divided about American foreign policy in general. Uh, a majority thinks that America should not have an assertive foreign policy, that it should not be that interventionist, and that's reflected in the Obama administration. But a, a significant minority are more interventionist, more willing to act, and that would be the Hillary Clinton-like approach. Okay? So Democrats are divided, but they lean in a dovish direction, and Republicans are clearly interventionist and assertive. Republicans are really clear that they need to take Israel's side in the conflict. It's part of a wider conflict with radical Islam and terrorism. Democrats are divided on that. They're not sure. Some people think, like Tom Friedman would say, Israel's wrong about settlements. It needs to support a Palestinian state more. But it's right about Hamas and Hezbollah. Other younger, younger people, younger liberal writers, younger bloggers, younger people in the Obama administration would, would be far more critical of Israel's security requirements, not only its policies on two states and on on um, settlements, and that's a real difference. So for, for example, in the negotiations, when it comes to Israel's security requirements in the Jordan Valley, yeah, older Democrats, older liberals, tend to be more sympathetic. They tend to look at Hamas and Hezbollah and they say, we recognize these kind of ways of thinking. They remind us of the totalitarianism of the Soviets, uh, the fascism of the Nazis, we recognize extremism. We don't think you can deal with it rash, you know, in, in a nice way. You need to be forceful and assertive. You know, if there's Palestinians who are not like that, you need to come towards them. So they're, 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 but younger ones tend to think, no, Israel exaggerates its security threats. Uh, it needs to be more careful in how it pursues its uh, security policy. And, and to a large degree, the Iraq war uh, is a dividing line. For the younger generation, Many of them, like Peter Beinart, for example, were supporters of the Iraq war. They saw it turned out badly, and they see it as a package deal. Iraq was a bad idea, so what else did Bush do in the Middle East? He supported Israel a lot. So if Iraq's not a good idea, supporting Israel a lot is not a good idea. That doesn't mean that they don't sympathize with Israel anymore, but on policy questions, they take that whole strategy, and they say, it was all bad, we need to do the opposite. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit um, about Protestants. Protestants are important because about half of Americans are Protestants. Um, American, America was set up by Puritan Protestants, and you know, for many years, Americans were far more than half. Protestants made up far more than half of Americans. And of course, if we look at American politics, we say, who are the two groups, social groups, that are most active on the Arab-Israeli conflict on opposite sides, it's the evangelicals and the mainline church. Uh, evangelicals, there are more evangelicals that believe um, that they should support Israel for biblical reasons than there are Jews in the world by a factor of 
three, four, five, something like that. Okay? Evangelicals are, you know, a huge part of the population, and they're politically active. Um, they, they support Israel for a variety of reasons that I can go into with you, but the key thing I would say that maybe is a little bit counterintuitive is the most important thing for them is that it says in Genesis that God will bless those who bless Israel and curse those who curse Israel. They do all the kind of Armageddon stuff, but the real thing is that they use as their kind of line is, if the government of Israel supports it, even if we don't like it, we support it. So on the disengagement from Gaza, they were against it. They didn't lobby against it because it was Israeli government initiative. If it had been an American government initiative, they would have been active against it, right? They're hawkish. They support the settlements. But if the Israeli government decides otherwise, from their point of view, it's Israel's decision, okay? The interesting thing that you might not know is that the mainline church, which is also huge, right, all the kind of non-evangelical Protestants, is the main source of uh, the divestment campaign in America. And here's the interesting thing about them, is that for them, it's the only part of American society that is anti-Zionist, not critical of Israeli policies, but doesn't, those people who are activists in the divestment movement do not accept the right of the Jewish people to self-determination in any borders in the historic land of Israel, 67 or otherwise, okay? And they are, they have a historic, what have I done? Okay. Doesn't go further than that. Yeah, here we go. Um, they have a historic tie to the Middle East. Um, very briefly, though, this is an elite divide, right? The activists in the main line and the activists in the evangelical are at polar opposite ends of the scale, right? Anti-Zionist and right-wing Zionist ideologically. But the publics, if we look at the evangelicals and mainline publics here, sympathy with Israel, well, they both of them have increased their support, right? The mainline public is quite close to the general public. It's slightly less sympathetic to Israel than the, main, the mainstream public America, but it's more or less the same. It's the evangelicals who are extremely supportive. But if we look at the divestment decision that the Presbyterians took in 2004, we see something interesting. We see what an elite phenomenon it is. If you ask lay Presbyterians, right, members of the Presbyterian church, a minority were in favor of divestment. Right? The majority were against divestment. If you ask pastors, they were about evenly divided. If you went to the General Assembly, which made the decision, it was 87% in favor, right? In other words, the politics of the mainline church on Israel is run by quite a small minority who are very, very active. We can get into why and who in Q&A if you want. So here, whereas on Democrats and liberals and conservatives and Republicans, the divide is really deep, it's elites, it's publics, Right? It's not about sympathy for Israel, it's about policy. Here, the publics are more or less on the same page. One is more sympathetic, the other less. Right? One is more like Democrats, one is more like Republicans. But the elites who care are about as far apart as it's possible to be. American Jews, a very big story that I'm only going to touch on. I think the thing that I want to say to you about American Jews is you probably all know the ins and outs and the intricacies of American Jewry and J Street and all of that. What I want to say is it's of a piece with the big story. It's not just a Jewish story. If we look at American Jews and their emotional attachment to Israel, you know what? It hasn't changed very much. I mean, it has changed on the inside, right? But it's a lot of movement. But the bottom line numbers haven't actually changed that much because... There are more Orthodox Jews. There are more kids going on birthright. So that counterbalances out uh, assimilation and intermarriage and the effect of that on Israel. So in the end, it all balances out. What has changed, and here's just a little thing that I kind of like, that there are, um, Jews believe less than the general public in America that Israel was given to the Jewish people by God, which I kind of like, that, that uh, black Protestants believe it more than Jews. Okay, it just tells you uh, something cute about America, um, that if we, look at, if we look at Jews on settlements, which I've just taken here, what we see is basically Jews are divided about settlements. American Jews are divided about settlements just like Israelis are. They even have 
Yeah? A negative perception of whether, this is from 2013, whether the Israeli government is serious about peace, unlike mainstream Americans. Mainstream Americans, Democrats and Republicans, think, right, Israel's serious about peace. American Jews don't, right? American Jews don't, 38 to 48. Okay, but the really important thing that holds that divide on settlements and holds this divide on Israel's credibility in check and prevents the paradox I'm talking about splitting apart is this number. Only 12% of American Jews think the Palestinian leadership is serious about peace. In other words, Jews are very divided, but they, they're united about one thing. There's no partner. Okay? And in that, they're very similar to Israelis. right? And that's a very big hold together. So you have this paradox that runs through the whole of, the, of, of American political culture that I tried to show you. That on the one hand, people, Americans sympathize with Israel. It goes across the board. On the other hand, they're more and more divided about policy. One of the things that holds that divide back and prevents it really exploding is credibility on peace. So why, in the, why is this, where does this divide come from? Well, it comes from America. It's less about Israel and what Israel does, does than you might think. It's about changes in America. The Republicans are a conservative party. They were not always, but they have become increasingly a, a conservative party. The Democrats were always a moderate party with a liberal wing and a conservative wing. Look at 2000. There's almost the same amount of conservatives in the Democrats as there are liberals, and the largest group by far yeah, are moderate. Today, the largest group are liberals, and there are conservatives are on their way out of the party. So when we think about our divide, yeah, our, our, our um, partisan divide on the Arab-Israeli conflict, it almost lines up perfectly with ideology. America's become more ideologically polarized in political terms. Ditto on the Arab-Israeli conflict. Now, what makes it particularly intense about on, on Israel and the Arab-Israeli conflict is if you say, what is the largest divide between the parties and ideologically in American politics, what's it about? It's about foreign policy and strategy. It's not about abortion, funnily enough, right? That's where the big divide is, and it's got bigger. So the big question on strategy that people tend to ask is, do you believe in peace through strength or, 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 uh, or diplomacy and, th and things like that, yeah? So look, if we look in 1997, we see that a majority of Democrats and Republicans agreed with that statement, and you know, Republicans were a bit, haw bit more hawkish. But now look at it, 2012. Republicans have become more in agreement with this statement, Democrats less, so that now they're divided. A majority of Democrats don't agree with it, and a majority of Republicans do agree with it. And then we ask, do you believe that Islam encourages violence more than other religions? So both Republicans and Democrats increasingly believe it, but that now they're divided. Before, it was only a small percentage who believed it, right? Now, Republicans have doubled, right? Nearly two-thirds of Republicans believe this, and less than a third of Democrats believe it. So if we look at the Middle East and we ask, what are your strategic priorities? Democrats are more divided than Republicans, like we saw in the discourse, but they tend to think you need to be assertive. You need to deal with, there are certain enemies out there that can't be reasoned with. Right? Democrats are divided between themselves about that, but younger ones tend to think that's not true. Okay? And Israel, uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict, fits into that. Right? So all the attitudes we see to the conflict line up with these kind of divides. It's not actually about Israel, because Israel, everybody's sympathetic with. Right? Whether they're sympathetic and critical or sympathetic and not critical, they're sympathetic. But when it comes to policy, it's not about Israel. It fits into how you think about America, right? How you think about America's world, uh, well, uh, interest, what you think America should do, the way you think the world works, what you think is dangerous, what you think is a threat, what you don't think is a threat. How do you deal with threats? Okay? And so, you know, you look in 2012, Democrats, okay, like I said, divided. Should America, you know, is the main danger that America will act well too quickly on Iran? Or is it that uh, it will take too long? Republicans are sure that the main problem is that America will wait too long and Iran will go nuclear. Sorry, wrong one. Okay. And the thing about American society is it's becoming more liberal. OK? 
Okay? Right now, there are double the amount of people who identify as conservative than liberal in the United States. But in what's called the millennial generation, the youngest generation, it's the first generation in which there's a majority to find themselves as liberal. So right now, okay, if you're looking at the Arab-Israeli conflict, Israel can turn around and say, well, there's lots of conservatives. But that is changing. And so this issue is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. <coughs> As we can see here, trends in sympathy for Israel by age. Yeah? Older people are more sympathetic, and they felt 9-11 more, more strongly. Yeah? It's not that young people have ceased to sympathize with Israel. It's not about whether they love us, right? It's the same. It hasn't changed. It's about policy. Okay, so that, that's, that's the, the, this. I'll leave you with that, and you can work out why I put it there another time. But I just wanted to conclude. What does all this mean politically? What, this, what is more significant? Is it, is it more significant that more people sympathize with Israel than ever before? Or is, it more or is it more significant that Americans are more divided about policy? So I want you to think of it like this. Uh, in the old days, there were five people in the room, and four and a half of them were saying the same thing about Israel. Okay? Now there are 15 people in the room, and there are eight or nine of them saying the same thing about Israel. Right? So there is more support for Israel, but... There's a couple of people saying different things on either side, right? And if you're sitting in the room and you want to get the message, what is it? I'm a, I'm a congressman. What is it that I need to do to support Israel? In the old one, I had a, it was less loud, but I could hear the message really clearly. Now it's louder, but I can't hear the message so clearly because some of the messaging cancels itself out. Okay? And that is why, in my view, the polarization that's taking place is more significant. And the challenge for Israel, which I'm happy to address in Q&A, is how to address that. What is the sweet spot you know, in American politics where Israel can retain not only sympathy, but bipartisan political support? And we can well understand why the Prime Minister of Israel, having seen all the figures that I did, has acted in the way he did. Okay? But we can also understand the negative consequences yeah, of acting in that way. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. Enjoy the rest of your talk. Okay, right here. Is it on? Yeah. I think it's working now. Great, I'm just going to take my watch. I need to keep track of time here. Uh, so we're going to get to some questions in a few minutes. Uh, I'm going to start out with a couple of uh, thoughts and, and questions for you, Jonathan, um, on your very, very interesting uh, presentation with uh, the very interesting poll, uh, poll findings that you showed us. Uh, the, I want to start out with something very basic, which is the notion of what it means to be sympathetic to Israel and what it means to be hostile towards Israel. These are words that uh, you've used, uh, and these are words that are essentially uh, part and parcel of your of your argument in your book. And uh, in this country, at least, we've we've really seen kind of this growing polarization. And you've pointed out this you know this polarization. But uh, whereas in the past there was essentially one major pro-Israel lobby by the name of APAC, uh, which some people consider still to be the only game in town. In town today, there's uh, a plethora of voices, uh, much, a much more diversified uh, set of viewpoints, in, and a debate, a growing debate, um, in terms of what it actually means to be pro-Israel. So if somebody who considers themselves to be a sympathizer of Israel, even a Zionist, has a significant problem with policies that this and perhaps other governments have pursued, uh, is that person in your mind, considered not pro-Israel. And same thing with, uh, with the issue of hostility. If somebody criticizes Israel for settlements and says, I can't uh, stomach the settlements and we need to take a tougher line, is that person considered hostile? Or can that person be regarded as a friend? So how do you kind of draw this, this uh, distinction? Okay, you want me to answer that? Please. 
So I, I think that's at the heart of my book in the sense that what I'm saying is that the interesting thing about Americans is they emotionally and ideologically identify with Israel. Uh, it's got nothing to do with policy. In other words, they just feel either for identity, civilizational reasons that come from Protestantism, that there's something called the Judeo-Christian thing, and we're all in the same thing. That's one thing. And the other thing is the democracy thing and the liberal values thing. What I would say to you is like this. The difference, an American critique of settlement policy would say, I care about Israel. I identify with Israel because it's a democracy. If I was an Israeli, I'd be against settlement policy. I'm angry because I identify, because I'm emotionally engaged, and because I want the best for the state of Israel. And if that state of Israel is bombed by nasty people, I'm going to support it, right? I come from the UK, and I can tell you I know what the difference is. If I'm in the UK and I'm dealing with someone who's shouting me about, uh, about settlement policy, um, they will probably, uh, not, not in the Jewish community, but uh, you know, in the general, they will probably feel um, that Israel is strong. It's something like a colonial entity. It shouldn't have been created. And the Israelis get what they deserve, right? That's very, very different. And you know, they're not going to lift a finger if Israel is under attack. In fact, they're going to be more concerned about the other side. So it's qualitatively different. And that's, that's my point is that the sympathy becomes very important politically when it comes to what I call obvious situations of that threaten Israeli security. The more obvious and direct it is, the more that Americans will just mobilize and think that the United States should stand behind Israel, even when they criticize every other policy of the state of Israel. In Europe, that is, n that is not the case. Um, large parts of Europe are anti-Zionist. The left, uh, in America, the left is liberal. So it believes um, that what people think and what people do is how you judge people. Israel's a democracy, we like it. If Israel behaves like a democracy, we like it more. If it doesn't, we like it less, and we criticize it. Uh, the left in Europe is, comes out of a class-based left, so it's who's strong and who's weak. We, we identify with the weak ones. We see the Palestinians as the weak ones. Therefore, whatever they do, they're in the right. And so you can get, in, a Euro on, in Europe, a sense that we could si we, we overlook the ideology of Hamas and Hezbollah, and we forgive them because they're weak, and we kind of say, well, if they weren't weak, they wouldn't think it. And just to give you, I'll give you a quote from someone who supports the academic, one of the leaders of the academic boycott in the UK, who said that from, the, from our point of view, a superstitious Palestinian peasant who supports Hamas is more progressive than a secular Israeli who supports Zionism even critically. Now, that, you're just not going to hear that among the most liberal critic of Israeli settlement policy in the United States, right? It comes from a different place, and that has ramifications uh, on, when it comes to Israeli security. Um, it's, quali it's qualitatively different in the United States. Um, you know, people who say Obama is, you know, anti-Israel. If I threw, if I just took Obama's statements and put him in Europe, you know, he'd be off the, he'd be off the, you know, be off the scale in pro-Israel, right? It's all relative to America. And I think that that uh, is critical. And I think that what you're saying about different types of support for Israel is the critical thing that, you know, Abe Foxman, the head of the ADL, used to say, uh, Israeli democracy decides, American Jews support. Con consensual solidarity, right? That's changed. We now have what I'd call pluralistic solidarity, which is American Jews look at who they like in Israel, who they support, and they support them, not Israeli democracy. They say, okay, I identify with the right, I'm gonna give money to right-wing organizations. I identify with the left, I'm gonna give money to left-wing organizations. I identify with the reform movement, I'm gonna, et cetera. So it's, uh, it, you know, in many ways, it's a symptom of a greater interaction with Israel, but it, on different terms. But just to follow up, it would also, and you don't necessarily need to answer this, but it would also, seemingly make it more difficult to measure statistically the pro versus the, uh, you know, the pro-Israel uh, people versus the critics of Israel in terms of figuring out, well, who among the critics are Zionists or are sympathetic to Israel and who among the critics 
uh, are much more anti or hostile to Israel? I think I don't. I think you know, in in polls, they ask simple questions like, "Do you sympathize with Israel?" And if I take it at face value, if they say yes, they do, and then a, a percentage of those disagree with Israeli policy. I, it's not that complicated, and. You know, in in magazine articles and in politics, obviously people have agendas, so it's it's harder, you know, harder to know. John Mearsheimer will always say, "I care about Israel." I mean, he doesn't care, you know, but he has to say it, right? Sure. Which tells you something about America, but not about him. Um, um, so I think you can you can actually measure it, and it's strike the, the difference. To, let me put it to you like this: When I say I'm from Israel in America, I get oh. When I say I'm from Israel in Britain, I get, oh. We all know the difference, but it's the same word. I want to move on to your second part of your presentation, which dealt with the issue of partisanship. Yeah. Um, and uh, you kind of laid out this, uh, this pattern showing that increasingly Republicans and conservatives are more sympathetic with Israel nowadays than Democrats and liberals. Yeah. And this raises kind of two questions. One has to do with the American Jewish community. The American Jewish community is overwhelmingly liberal and Democrat still, despite the fact that every four years we hear this time more of them are going to vote Republican, and certainly among the Orthodox Jews that is true. But by and large, uh, election after election, uh, the Democratic candidate, including President Obama, will get the overwhelming majority of the votes. So, so that the question here is, is there perhaps then a growing disconnect or potential disconnect between the American Jewish community and, uh, and Israeli Jews? And the second part of that question has to do with the nature of uh, partisanship and support for uh, Israeli governments, depending on whether we have a Republican or, Democrat or Democratic administration. And perhaps one question that I would posit is, is it really more about whether we have a Democrat or Republican in power here or whether we have a right-wing Likud government in Israel versus a more liberal labor government. Because if you take, if you take a look at the last uh, 25 years, President Bo uh, Bush 41st uh, had a very um, uh, negative relationship with Shamir, with Likud's Yitzhak Shamir, but a very positive relationship with labor's Yitzhak Rabin. Um, Bill Clinton, a Democrat had a very positive relationship with uh, Rabin as well, but a very negative relationship with Netanyahu, who was fulfilling his first term there. And I can go on and provide other, other examples, but perhaps part of it has to do with the, go the government in power in Israel and the greater ease in which an administration in the United States, Republican or Democrat, liberal or conservative, has in dealing with a more liberal Israeli government. Okay. Um so two big points there. I'll start with American Jews uh, and Israel. Um, I think what's actually quite interesting is that if I was to sum up Amer Israeli public opinion on the peace process, it would go something like this. We are more prepared to make concessions than we have ever been, but we do not believe that even if we make more concessions than we think is wise or desirable, that we will actually get a minimal level of peace of security, which we define in minimal terms as my child, when he goes to eat pizza, will not get blown up. Uh, middle Israel, more or less. I think it's very close to middle American Jewry. I, I don't, in terms of publics as opposed to politics, I think, you know, you know, what we saw, that very low figure for the credibility of the Palestinians on the peace process, Israelis are divided about whether they think Netanyahu is serious about peace, so are American Jews. The balance is going to be a bit different, but it's not hugely different. Uh, but they agree on the one big thing, and that's why it's so important. And what, as I said, you what holds it together is the fact that there's a perception that there's actually no partner, and it, that perception dampens down what would could be otherwise a much more explosive situation. Um, and as I said, it's it's not so. The Democrats are divided within themselves. The fact that American Jews support the Democrats. Uh, is a very important thing holding bipartisanship together because it kind of shores up yeah, what would otherwise perhaps, as we see, is pulling away. So um, I'm not sure that, th and this is what I think our prime minister is missing, actually, that by putting all his, first of all, there's no democracy in which one party always wins. So putting all your eggs in the Republican basket 
is not wise, right? You, you don't need me, to, you don't need to be a political scientist to, to know that. The second thing is that actually, that the fact that American Jews are so supportive of the Democrats is incredibly important if, as we see, that the, there's gonna be some friction between uh, Democrats and Israel on security issues which are relatively consensual, never mind the settlements and the, and the and, uh, Palestinian state stuff. So what about Labour and Likud? Yeah, obviously it's easier for an American administration to deal with an Israeli government that is more on the, in the center or the left. It's 100%. Uh, but what's interesting to me is that W the divisions that I'm talking about hold underlyingly, even if there's a left-wing government, right? And that's what's really interesting. So for example, in 2007 and 2008, Gallup asked Americans, who do you think America should put most of the pressure on in the peace negotiations? And we had an Israeli government that put the whole of the West Bank and East Jerusalem on the table, right? So it was clearly a dovish government. And a majority of liberals clearly thought that most of the American pressure should be on Israel, and a majority of, of conservatives clearly thought it should be on the Palestinians. In other words, of course it's easier and less stressful and less tense when you have a center-left government. And one of the lessons for Israel about how to deal with this bipartisanship under threat is that Israel must be credible about a two-state solution to keep the Democrats on board. It doesn't mean it has to withdraw tomorrow. It doesn't have to mean it has to take all the blame, but it must be credible. And expanding your settlements all over the place every time an American Secretary of State comes out is undermines your credibility so that even if you're Netanyahu and you agree to negotiate on the basis of the 1967 borders, which is a huge concession, right? And it's beyond what any Israeli government left or right did before, 19, before 2000. In other words, he's more dovish than Yitzhak Rabin was. Right? But if you, at the same time, then the, the week after you do that, expand settlements, okay, you're not gonna be credible to the Democrats. And so you're gonna be in a problem. Uh, so it's clear to me, at least, that if you, want, if you wanna keep bipartisanship, you have to be credible on the peace process. It, uh, as I said, the fact that the other side isn't seen as that it will give you a helping hand. Um, but looking at it from a Democrat's point of view, or from a, uh, you know, the American public as a whole backs Israeli security in a broad terms, not getting into the weeds of the details of the Jordan Valley and what you know international force. Or, you know, without that, they increasingly feel that Israeli security is somehow a bellwether, a touchstone, an acid test of American security. That if you don't stand by Israel, it means you're not being tough on the kind of things that America needs to be tough on. And th that's a huge majority of Republicans, but it's also a lot, a hell of a lot of Democrats, right? And that, therefore, it makes, if Israel wants that, which is the really critical thing for Israel, right? if the Democrats are wise, they won't touch that because then they'll start to take on huge swathes of American opinion, not just Israel. And if the Israelis are smart, they will look at the peace process and say, we, got, we need to be credible on this. You know, we can make arguments about, you know, the other side isn't serious, or we can say we need this for our security, but we can't do things that make it look like we're not serious. So I want to pick up on that last point and ask you one more question before I open it up to the audience, and that it has to do with the issue of security. Yeah. Um, on, the, on the big picture question of security, um, I would absolutely agree with what you said in terms of how Americans perceive American threats and Israeli threats, and there's that common thread. Uh, which leads many to sympathize with Israel and Israel's security situation, especially given who's surrounding Israel and what Israel's facing. Uh, at the same time, it is not lost on American policymakers that you have more and more Israeli security officials, ex-security officials, who are speaking out against the Netanyahu government's policies, who are being very critical of the government and with a few exceptions, one being uh, Moshe Ya'alon, the, the defense minister, who was a former IDF chief of staff, we're seeing that the vast majority of former IDF chiefs of staff, heads of military intelligence, head of, heads of Shin Bet, heads of Mossad, are really staying away from Netanyahu and his right-wing uh, Likud party and the party to his right, the Baidi Udi, and they're moving more towards the center, even center-left. 
Um, and I, I just kind of wrote a, a short list here, but I'm sure you're familiar with the same names that I am. Uh, you have, uh, you know, Diskin and Gallant and others. Um, they're saying something very different than what the government's saying in terms of what Israel's security needs are. So in a sense, aren't some of the democratic or liberal critics of Israel who, again, are see, see themselves as pro-Israel, aren't they closer in line in some respect with some of these ex-security officials? Okay. Um, I think we need to make a distinction. First of all, there are a lot of Israeli security officials who disagree with Netanyahu, but there are also quite a lot who agree. Obviously, we hear from the ones who don't agree because that's news, um, and it's worth dealing with. Uh, but if we look at the differences, with one possible exception on the Iran issue, the Israeli security establishment on the substance thinks Netanyahu is right. In other words, they think that Obama is wrong, that Iran is a serious security threat, that you do have to threaten to use force to stop it, and that negotiations probably won't be successful. However, they don't think it's that Israel would be wise to act on its own without the support of the United States. And in this, by the way, they have the backing by a wafer-thin majority of the Israeli public, which is very surprising, right? It's a change, okay? So uh, the, the security establishment is more sensitized to the US relationship. And it, this could be a result of several things, one of which is that America has never been more open with the Israeli security establishment about what it can do and what it does. Um, and they do this, and they support Israel in a bear hug. It's designed to constrain us, and it did. Uh, there's a chance that Israel may well have attacked Iran in before the last presidential election, and one of the reasons it didn't is because the security establishment basically said to the prime minister, we don't want to go to war with America, right? Uh, not that the Obama administration said don't do it. They just said, if you do it, you're on your own. We're not going to help you. And without American help, it's a lot more of a risky proposition. Um, the real difference, though, so there's no real difference on security, so to speak. There's a difference on the peace process. The, the security establishment is, tends to be pragmatic and says, you know, this whole settlement thing is a wake. What, 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 this just causes trouble, right? What's the point of it all? Some of the security establishment are more dovish ideologically, and some of them are just pragmatic, and some of them are more hawkish. I think the most interesting person is Yaakov Amidro, who was Netanyahu's national security advisor. So he's no lefty, right? He now says, okay, there's no partner for peace. Strategically, I think Israel's going to have to unilaterally withdraw from large parts of the West Bank. That's very interesting, right? That's very interesting because it's saying that, you know, when the even those whose predisposition is to agree with Netanyahu, and those who are close around, Michael Oren, previous ambassador who was appointed by Netanyahu, are saying something publicly that the prime minister doesn't back. And we don't know. Perhaps privately he does. We just don't know, right? We don't, you know, who knows? Only Sarah knows, right? She probably told him what to think. Um, so, so I think you've, you've got something. But I think it's important to distinguish between the settlement issue, on which it's vociferous, and the security issue where it's, we agree in principle, but we weigh the US position more heavily than you do. Okay, great. And with that response, I'd like to open it up to you some questions. Please, Professor. So there's an elephant in the room. In can you introduce yourself? Also? Aron Carmel from the Kogut School of Business. There's an elephant in the room, and Laura told me that I'm allowed to ask this because I, I missed most of the presentation. So Jonathan. Um, the President of the United States is not welcoming the Prime Minister of Israel next week. Um, talk about that elephant in the room. Okay, so, so here's my thing. I understand why the Prime Minister thinks it's worth using the Republicans against the Democratic President. Because if you look at all the numbers, including on Iran, that's the way they fall. But it's foolish. It's foolish in the extreme, even, um, for the reasons that I said before, which is that, you know, uh, 
never mind who you know I sympathise with or you sympathise with. There, there's no way that Republicans are going to win every election from now to eternity, right? So basic common sense says you want bipartisan support, which is only you know increased when we we you know we reflect on what Guy said, which is American Jews uh, support the Democrats, are liberal, and they're going to continue to support the Democrats and be liberal, whatever whatever happens, right? So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quite a serious mistake by the Prime Minister. Uh, it's a mistake because the Democrats don't want to confront an Israeli Prime Minister. There's nothing in it for them, electorally, right? Um, it's done damage to Israel's attempt to stiffen uh, the policy of the Obama administration, because now there are Democrats in Congress who would have taken a tougher line, but are now not going to because they feel uh, if it's a choice between the Democratic Party or Israel, it's the Democratic Party, right? Uh, which they didn't think before, right? Uh, they thought they could be Democrats who disagree and, you know. But, you know, the Israeli ambassador to the U.S. Is, is, has sharpened and worsened a situation that exists, that we've spoken about. Whereas the trick would be to soften it and blur it. And... Uh, it's not like the U.S.-Israeli relationship is going to collapse tomorrow, but if we think of the special relationship in ecological terms, um, what's happened is damaged the ozone layer, right? It's damaging the ozone layer of bipartisanship, and it's these sorts of things uh, are hard to undo. You know, in psychology they say, you know, five. It takes five positive acts of trust to undo. Uh, one act of mistrust. Well, it's, it, I think it's true in international relations as well, and there's been so many. Um, so it's done, it's done huge damage. Yeah, I think it has. But I don't think we'll see any immediate damage. Um, and I don't think it will punch through to the Israeli public unless John McCain and Joe Lieberman decide to stand up and do a joint press conference and say, we think this is a bad idea. And that's not going to happen. Next question. Yeah, go ahead. Somebody. Sure. Okay. And Mike, introduce yourself. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Michael Smith. Um, so uh, thank you very much for uh, coming in today. I um, just wanted to go back to what you'd said earlier about sort of the difference in how um, parties or how different uh, ideologies have different sort of values, uh, value systems that lead them to support Israel. Um, you know, if you look at sort of the left broadly, where they're talking about. Um, you know, the, the Zionist left in the U.S., you're talking about um, a more, so maybe some of the more mainline Protestant denominations that, with the elite members or, or what have you, student groups or whatever. One of the threads that runs through it is an emphasis on human rights, social justice, um, alongside, you know, their support for, for Israel. And so um, I'm wondering if, um, I mean, it's something, a dynamic that I think many people pointed out, that it's becoming increasingly hard to sort of separate the two. You know, the default assumption would be we support Israel, you know, I support Israel, and I support human rights and, you know, justice, and that these are not mutually exclusive things. There's no tension, no conflict inherent therein. But I think as it's become more and more well-known on campuses and, you know, across the country, that there are injustices going on in the West Bank, for example, or that the people of Gaza, the, the new phrase is mowing the grass, that once every few years, you know, some portion of the pal pal innocent Palestinian civilians will die as a result of another inconclusive round of fighting that doesn't resolve anything, and in two more years or another year and a half, we'll have another round. These things, I think, are making it more difficult, and I'm wondering what your sort of perspective is on um, how that plays into uh, support for Israel in the, on the American left, as opposed to sort of just seeing Israel as the weaker party, uh, as that might be the case in Europe. So I think that if one looks at um, discourse in liberal magazines, which is what I did. Um, what you see is the more you, on the left, say, if you're the sort of person who says, I care about human rights, and I care about uh, humanitarian issues and things like that, um, and I judge, I'm, I'm I, I judge everyone by blindly, by what they do and what they say. Right, um, uh, so I look at Israel, and I might be critical of this, that, and the other. I look at Hamas, I look at what they say, and I look at their policies. I look at what they do, and I have a sophisticated, you know, I understand it's a bit of on the one hand, on the other hand, and and you know, y again, that tends to come out 
favorably to Israel, like critical, but favorable. In other words, you know, Israel has a right to self-defense. It would sound something like this. Israel has a right to self-defense. It doesn't always do that in the right way, but it always does it better than the other side. Yes, there are more people suffering on the other side, but that's primarily the responsibility of Hamas for the policies they do. It would be, in other words, it's the choices that you make. Liberals think, you know, individuals are endowed with self-determination and they make choices. So they would say, on that basis, I'd be sympathetic to Israel, but critical of some of the things it does. Michael Walzer, if you're looking for someone, yeah? The other type of left, which is more prevalent in Europe, says people who do bad things are less responsible for their own actions. It's because they are in a difficult situation. And if they weren't in a difficult situation, like class, Marxist type thinking, yeah? then they wouldn't do such things. Therefore, they are not so responsible. Who's responsible? The side that's strong. Israel's perceived to be strong. Therefore, it's perceived to be wrong. And that's the real cut, right? That's where the cut is. And obviously, there's mixes. I'm simplifying these mixes. But that's where, it, that's where the real dividing line is between uh, people who are sympathetic but critical and people who basically identify with the other side. It's to do with whether you think it, you know, whether you're more liberal or you're more left in simplistic terms. Uh, and the reason that America is different from Europe is because there are a hell of a lot more people that are critical on the liberal side than let the, the, the socialist class-based politics in the US has always been very weak. Those people who think like that are anti-Israel. Malcolm X, yeah, versus Martin Luther King, right? If you like, okay? Um, and when you come from a country which has a long tradition of class-based politics in which strong and weak is, is, is big news, then you get you know, municipalities in the UK flying the Palestinian flag, right? And, and making supportive statements like wipe out Hamas doesn't exist. The only thing that exists is the civilians, right? Because they're the suffering, they're the weak. So if, if I block out Hamas because I say their decisions don't count because they're weak, I forgive them, right? I, Look over, I look over that bit, right? Then that way of looking at things, while it does exist in the US, is much, much weaker than it is in Europe, and it's nothing to do with Israel. It's to do with the American political culture versus British or European political culture. So I think that those things uh, are not gonna change enormously, right? What you might see, and that what I think you are seeing in the US, is more criticism of Israeli policies Right? That's what we're seeing. And uh, that is something that is, of course, much more open to change. Because if it's policies, you can debate policies, you can agree with them, you can disagree with them, you can have an argument. Uh, fair enough, right? If it's who you are, if Israel is the equivalent of the kulaks who must be wiped out for the socialist resolution to happen, right? Then there's nothing Israel can ever do, right? Um, so that's the difference. And I think I'm optimistic in that sense that the US remains different. Uh, hi, my name is Donald Frank. Uh, so I'm going to go back to the numbers. In the last slide, it was 52% of, I guess, my generation, 25 to 34-year-olds, had a favorable view of Israel. Is that a bipartisan approach that roughly, I guess, self-described liberals and self-described conservatives believe that? Or are the numbers trending out that conservatives have a more favorable issue? And if so, conservatives favor more, is that a long-term threat to Israel's bipartisan approach in America? Uh, yeah, younger conservatives are more sympathetic to Israel than younger liberals. Um, and I think that uh, I don't, it, it'll take a long time for sympathy for Israel on the liberal Democrats. I had a very long time for it, even current trends for that to filter away. It, I mean, it's not going to happen in my lifetime, but uh, if at all. But it's already happening on policy. The politics of it has already happened. Yeah, because even people a little bit older than you who are now in, you know, working in the administration think differently on policy questions, and it's already happening, and it's just going to get more intense, and that's the real challenge. It's a, for the U.S.-Israel relationship, it's about policy, right? And, and that the, the partisanship is that Israel and Israel's friends in the U.S. who want to maintain a strong relationship have to look for the sweet spot in the relationship, which I've suggested is being credible about peace and being firm about security, okay? 
um, because if you stray too much from that, you're going to erode bipartisanship, which is already becoming is already an issue. If, if I may just ask one quick follow-up question to that same slide you were talking about, the millennials, yeah. uh, which obviously will interest a lot of people here. What about the um, growing Hispanic population and yeah. kind of the changes sure. that we're seeing demographically? Have yeah. you looked into that? Sure. I've looked into Hispanics. I don't deal with them. I deal with them within the democratic thing because Hispanics are the least interested of any uh, ethno-religious group in the U.S. in the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, so on one level, you say Hispanic support for Israel is lower than any other group. On the other hand, you say, yeah, but it's lower than any one for the Palestinians as well. And the gap in percentage terms is wide, it's very, very wide. And a lot of Hispanic, uh, a significant proportion of Hispanic Catholics are becoming Protestant, they're converting, they're becoming evangelical. So if anything on that trend line, uh, Hispanics are not gonna be a problem for Israel because they're just not that invested in the issue. And if they are, then they're sympathetic. Israel doesn't, I mean, I don't know, I mean this may be a surprise to you, Israel doesn't need American aid anymore. It needs American political support, it needs American to sell it weapons, but you know, uh, American aid to Israel is less than 1% of Israeli GDP. It's about 20% of the defense budget. If tomorrow the US said no aid, in economic terms, it could live without it. If America said tomorrow, we're not gonna veto anything at the UN and we're not gonna sell you weapons, that's a different story, right? So I don't think that, so, so if there's less you know, vociferous support for Israel in Congress because Hispanics are a larger part of the voting population, it won't matter. It won't matter. What matters is the liberals. Uh, I try to disguise myself as a student so they'd call on me. <laughs> and actually, I am a student, but I stopped paying tuition about five decades ago. Um, anyway, a couple of points. Um, I understand what you're saying about the mainline Protestant movement and founded on, on puritanical thing, uh, movement, and I, I appreciate their closeness to the Bible and the, the religious interpretation of the Bible and so forth. With regard to the position on, uh, on the BDS movement, how far back did they adopt the BDS movement? Because I, I was only aware for the past half dozen years they were in that, because I thought they would be more supportive. That's question one. Question two, I was going to ask you to describe what a two-state solution looks like. I hear everyone say that. What is it? What does that second state look like? How independent is it really? Please describe that. And um, lastly, what I try and wrap my arms around is, is the uh, position of the American liberal movement. Um, and they purport to be on the forefront of human rights, of women's rights, of, of, of gay rights, and so forth. And yet, they're very sympathetic to, to uh, a lot of these, um, to Hamas and, and, and Hezbollah and, and, and so forth. And they're supposed to be thinking individuals in college. At least that's how it was when I was there. And I don't get it. Okay. Oh, and excuse me, Adi asked me to introduce myself. I'm, I'm Toby, a former student. Thank you. Uh, so the, the mainline church, as opposed to evangelicals, is very interesting because uh, You've heard of the American University in Cairo where President Obama spoke and the American University in Beirut. That was set up by the mainline church and they didn't do a good job of converting Muslims to Christianity, but they helped found Arab nationalism, right? The, they saw the idea of a nation based on a language like the United States instead of a religion like Islam as a kind of way forward. And they were the main um, proponents of anti-Zionism and the support for uh, you know, Arab nationalism and um, it, at the time of uh, the Balfour Declaration and in the 1920s. And their children, the children of these missionaries who set up these universities, uh, staffed the State Department, Middle East Department in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and into the 1960s. Uh, so they, they were sympathetic to the Arab case, sympathetic to the Palestinians. That was always the case. But what happened was that a minority of the main line, Reinhold Niebuhr and people like that, um, moved away from pacifism and said, look, they were the liberals in my story. They said, these Jews are under threat. They don't have a homeland. They need a homeland. They have a right to self-determination like everyone else. Why should they have to be a minority everywhere? You know. Uh, 
not because it's said in the Bible, but because there are people, they deserve a homeland. And uh, because the Arabs also have a case, we have to divide that homeland. And that was Niebuhr. And in the wake of the Holocaust, he got a lot of support because making the case against the Jewish state after the Holocaust was a difficult was a difficult thing in the United States. And so between 1948 and 1967, the pro-Zionists in the mainline church were stronger. But it was, it, it was quite shallow. It was Niebuhr because he was this towering figure who was more important than any other theologian in the United States. And it was a thin layer, and it was the Holocaust. As soon as Israel became perceived to be strong again, right, after 67, you have m mainline Protestant leaders saying things like, in 67, uh, we haven't seen uh, a, a military action like this since Hitler's blitzkrieg. You know, pretty potent stuff, okay? And in, 19, in, the 1980, in 1981, when they came out in favor of a Palestinian state, um, the, the largest mm -hmm. mainline body, uh, it was only by a narrow majority that they said, and we recognize Israel's right to live in peace and security. In other words, their, their thinking was a mixture of these roots in the Middle East, support for Arab nationalism, and the kind of leftism, right? It was called liberation theology, uh, supporting the weak, right? Uh, was very powerful. Um, what happened was there was a peace process in the 1990s, so no one's going to come out against the peace process, right? That's like being against apple pie, right? And then in 2000, when the peace process collapsed, they, be, they put all the blame on Israel. You know, for them, it's all about what Israel does. Israel is the source of all, the, the occupation is the source of all evil, right? Uh, and so it doesn't matter what the Palestinians do, they, they get a pass, right? Israel is the one who has to be criticized, and that's where it comes from. That main, it's, it's a mixture of the historic ties to Arab nationalism and uh, a kind of uh, theological Marxism. The Palestinians are the weak. They are the suffering. We side with the weak and the suffering, and we don't ask too many questions about what they stand for and what their values are, because we say it's because they're suffering that they deserve our support. Um, and that goes to the third point that you said is, why do some people on the left uh, give Hamas and Hezbollah a pass? So actually, most American liberals do not give Hamas and Hezbollah a pass. They say they have abhorrent ideologies. They may be sympathetic to civilians, but they get that Hamas and Hezbollah are not nice, right? Um, but as intellectuals on the left who are influenced by Marxism agree with what I said before that was said in Britain about the boycott, that a Palestinian peasant who supports Hamas is more progressive than a liberal secular Israeli because they're the weak and they're suffering and they're the suffering class, they're the equivalent to the working class. Israel is the equivalent to the ruling class, right? And therefore, we side with the weak. And that is a has much stronger resonance in Europe, in trade unions and the like, than it does in the US, but it does have some resonance in the US. Those parts of academia that have a large Marxist influence, literary studies, American studies, Middle East studies, is where you find all this kind of stuff. Uh, you don't find it in physics. Uh, you don't find it in the natural sciences. You don't find, you know, the more it's, the more it's empirically scientific, the less this kind of thing, yeah, is uh, is popular. Two-state solution means different things to different people, but it, but I think the consensus would be that it means a Palestinian state in the ma the overwhelming majority of the West Bank, Gaza, with probably a significant part of Arab East Jerusalem as its capital, and security, uh, with special security rights for Israel to be negotiated, and no right of return for Palestinian refugees to the state of Israel. Um, now, the fact is that no one really, you know, I've made it sound like it's really obvious, but actually, if I was to open up each one of the things that I've said, you'd see that there's a lot of argument about it. What I can say to you is one of my friends was um, a senior negotiator for Israel. She, he worked for Sippy Livni in, 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 uh, in the previous government, uh, going back to 2008 when Olmer was prime minister. And he said to me, the Israelis and Palestinians were like two magnets. 
They were closer than they've ever been before, but they couldn't touch because the polarity was different. In other words, even when we agree on quite a lot of things, when we get down to the, some of the important details that really make a huge difference in how it will actually work, there are still some very, very significant differences, right? And each side has its own views about who's to blame and what's really right. Me too, right? But uh, I think that that's... I hope that goes some of the way to answering your question. I want to be conscious of everybody's time because uh, we do have a reception, uh, and I know you might want to do a book signing if people want to get your book afterwards. Um, but maybe we can take one final question, a quick question I, with a quick answer. I know Adi has a question, but are there any women that have questions? Or just answers? No. OK. Adi, do you want to ask the last question? Oh. Yeah, I want to, uh, uh, first of all, Adi Politi, I'm an alumni of the School of International Service and uh, former program associate with Laura at the Center for Israel Studies. Uh, you closed your presentation discussing millennials and potential future trends in this country and, and how the, the voting blocks could change American policy in the future. What are the time frames that, that you might project for those debates to intensify, for policies to switch? Uh, what could happen to maybe change it again in, into different trajectories? Uh, what is your research based on? And something that's, that's been interesting to me for years. That's why I'd love to touch on that before we okay, wrap so, up. So it's already in the mind and in the discourse. It's there. That's what I'm talking about. Your question is, when will it affect policy? My answer is it already is. And we might possibly see a dramatic example of it in the near future. And that could be what happens when the Palestinians go to the Security Council and they ask for a state on certain terms. Um, the ICC, the US, will uh, oppose. It will oppose it because it's for a whole host of reasons that are not related to Israel. It doesn't want the ICC poking its nose in lots of things. And it doesn't want the peace process, which should be under American tutelage, being taken over by other things. So there, there are separate reasons for that. And, and it thinks it's not constructive. And I think it's right. But um, if, however, the UN Resolution 242 has guided the peace process. It basically says land for peace and security. And that kind of puts the onus on the Arab side to provide the peace and security so that Israel gives up the land, right? So that was a huge deal. What Abbas is trying to do is change that. He's trying to say, if the Israelis don't come to an agreement within two years, five years, you know, then it's their fault. And therefore, that opens the door to sanctions against Israel, right? We want to define what a, a settlement should look like. And if Israel doesn't stick to its part and doesn't give up, then we have the right to pressure it. And we have the right to do lots of things. Uh, it's not beyond the scope of, re of real you know, of analysis that a, an Obama administration could say a partial yes to that. A partial yes. It's not going to be one-sided. But they might lay out a framework of what a two states would actually look like. And some of those things an Israeli government might not like, depending on what Israeli government, right? I suspect that they would also say things that the Palestinian Authority might not like. And that might not therefore be, from my perspective, that might not be a bad thing, right, personally. But that would be an example. Yeah, that an, an American administration is willing to say, look, on these policy questions, we're not gonna we're not gonna defer to you anymore. Uh, as I said, when it gets to the security stuff, if they were to do that, they'll get hit over the head in American politics, right? And they'll get hit over the head in Israeli politics. Um, and that and that there won't be the security establishment won't be arguing against Netanyahu. But if they if they focus it on the degree of territory to withdraw, like you know, based on 67 borders, or they focus it on settlements, things like that. You know, I think we could see it, yeah. I think we could, s it's possible that we could see it very, very soon. Okay, I wanna thank you very much for a thought-provoking, enlightening talk.